reason to praise him tonight? I said, do you have a reason to praise him tonight? We all have a reason, amen? If you were able this morning to stand up out of your bed on two feet, amen, we have a reason to praise him this morning, this evening. We're so glad that you joined us on church on Wednesday evening and uh, so glad that you made the choice to be here. And uh, tonight we're going to continue on with our uh, circle maker. And before we do, I want to ask, is there anybody that has a testimony you want to give real quick? We hear a lot of negative things, but let's talk about some positive things. I know somebody that does. And uh, so I'm going to stand here and wait on her. She, I've already looked at her, so, so I'm just going to stand right here and wait on her till she gets down here. And uh, how many of you know God's up to good things in our church? I, uh, I know that uh, the enemy is, is attacking, but when God is answering, the enemy's at work. Amen? Um, a couple Wednesday nights ago, as you were here, if you were here, um, I laid on, can we get a motion? I laid on this altar um, a picture and walked around this church and walked around um, these altars. And we've been trying for two years to get pregnant. And I found out that I'm seven weeks pregnant today. <laughs> Is that twins, triplets? <laughs> Anybody else? Or are you too scared you're going to have a baby? I don't know. You don't need this, do you? you're still sitting in your pew because the doctor said that would never ever happen again I said the doctor man said that that would never ever happen again but how many of you know man has his report but God has the last say I said God has the last say you are looking at a bona fide miracle standing right in your face tonight hallelujah hallelujah and he didn't have to say a word hallelujah Woo. Woo. what's impossible with man is possible with God amen Brother Grant used to say, oh, you ought to tell the devil to put that in his pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Amen? That's awesome. I'll tell you, and I've already said this before, and I've said it to him, so I'm not, not being disrespectful. The night that we left here, his wreck was the night of our revival that Brian McDonald preached. If you were here, do you remember that? In our revival, Pastor Brian McDonald preached that night. And, and Chris, just before the service, Brian and I were sitting right here and praise and worship was going on. His phone went off. He had to walk out and answer the phone. And he came back, walked in and told me before he walked up to preach. He said, a good friend of mine's son was just in a motorcycle wreck and, and they don't believe he's going to live. And he and I stood right there and we prayed. And then I don't remember if we had the church pray or not, but we stood right there and prayed. And that night after the service was over, Pastor Brian and I left and went to the hospital to see you. And a hospital full of people there. And I'll just tell you, I've said this to him before, I would not have given you two cents for his life that night. He was in such grave condition. His body, his head was about twice the size on that pillow. He had, he had tubes as where there could be a tube anywhere. He had one and more. And I just stood there and looked at him that night and I thought, Lord... You're going to have to do something here for this family. And God did something for this family. Amen. Not only did God do something for that family, but he did it for everybody in this room. Because if God can heal Chris, he can heal you. 
Amen. He can cause you to have a baby when you want a baby. He can, nothing's impossible. Amen. One more. Anybody else have one more? Are you pregnant? <laughs> no, I laid a bag of pills up here. And I have not had a pill, and it was for diabetes. I was taking a shot in the evening, a pill in the morning. I was on water pills to keep the water retention off. Give me pills to keep the diabetes from destroying my kidneys. I have not had a pill or a shot since then, and my numbers have been running between 80 and 100. Awesome. Awesome. And God healed her little dog. He was on her dog, little dog. How many of you know your, your dog can be like, can come like a child, like a family member? They're a family member. And she came to see me one day a few weeks ago and, and was upset, and I was upset with her. We have Princess. Princess is my fourth daughter, and, uh, and uh, she's 11 years old. And uh, Princess is just like one of us. She goes when we go, and, and we travel. She's with us. And, and uh, when she came to see me the other day, she was really upset. And she said, Pastor, my little dog today may go away. Had her for a long time. The Lord healed that dog. And that dog was here with us uh, Halloween night, Monday night, and uh, she was in her costume and, and, and everything else. So, so uh, God cares about your animals too. Amen. Amen. Monday night, we had 3,250 people come across this property. You ought to give yourself a hand clap of praise. If you gave any candy, if you gave money, or if you did anything to make that night successful, I can tell you that it was a successful. 3,250 people felt like 8,000. <laughs> but, uh, but we had a great time. And, uh, and I believe the people had a great time. At one point, our line was from, where are we standing? From, from the parking lot right here where they entered in, wrapped all the way around the building, all the way around Legacy, and the line ended in the Methodist parking lot up the hill. And people stood in line for over two hours to come through to get candy. And I cannot tell you how many people, because I, I greeted every person that came in the door. I stood right here at the corner of everybody came in. I greeted every person that came in and introduced myself to them and invited them to church. And I can't tell you how many people said to me, I've been coming here for years. How many people said, this is the only place that I'm going, that I'm taking my kids tonight because we feel safe here. I mean, there, out, out of all of those people in that amount of time that we brought those people through, I did not have one complaint, not one complaint, any whatsoever. There were some things we realized, and we know that we need to improve for next year. We need some porta potties, and we need bottles of water, and some other things. So we, we've got all that, but not one complaint. And um, and I just want to say thank you um, uh, for what you did, and 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 it was just a fantastic night. Amen. Tonight, I hope that you have a worksheet for chapter 10 and then also for chapter 11 as we will get there tonight. If you don't, you can raise your hand and our wonderful ushers will make sure that you have one if you'll raise your hand high enough. Um, yes. You're here because of last night? Well, thank you. You're an answered prayer. You're an answered prayer for it. We're glad that you're here. Thank you. If you'll raise your hand high enough, they'll make sure that you get a worksheet. While you have your hand held up and you're, you're uh, waiting for us to start, I just want to tell you that um, uh, I'm pleased to tell you that on the second Sunday of December, we uh, uh, will be meeting to start a new class uh, here on Sunday mornings. It will be a part of our Sunday school, and we'll be starting a Spanish class on on that morning for our Spanish-speaking people, Brother Frank uh, and his wife are going to be teaching that class for us. And uh, we, have, we have a number of people that are coming that are Spanish-speaking uh, and others that we feel that are in the community that well, this will be of a benefit. So that what we're going to do on that Sunday morning in Sunday school is just meet as a time of fellowship. And we'll have a, have a you know, when we fellowship, we have to have food. Uh, so that morning there will be some kind of food that morning. 
and uh, we're just going to introduce the class and invite those that, that uh, may want to be a part of that class. And then in December, or I'm sorry, in uh, January, it will become a regular part of our Sunday school. We are we're doing the legwork right now to to meet people and and invite and so on. So if you know someone that's Spanish speaking and and would benefit from that class, please let me or Brother Frank know, and we'll make sure that they get an invitation um, to that class. We're looking forward. Um, to that. Tonight I want to go on in chapter 10 and I hope you've got your sheet there ready to go and I'll finish chapter 10 tonight and then we will move on um, uh, uh, to chapter 11. Brother Grizzle, when is your birthday? Monday. Monday. Brother Grizzle will be 90 years young on Monday. So happy early birthday. Amen. I want to talk to you tonight, finish talking to you from chapter 10, but let me just review to catch you up. And maybe you missed last week. Uh, chapter 10 in the book that we're studying, and we're almost finished with this. Um, chapter 10 begins with the story of the Dallas Theological Seminary. And in the book he told you that it was uh, facing uh, financial bankruptcy and was about to collapse. And uh, God moved in. And, and uh, changed that, if you will, for them. And so there was three pieces or three points, I guess, that I took out of that story and we talked about last week for just a moment. I'm not going to redo that. You can go back and watch that uh, from last week or you can get the notes. But out of that, we said uh, that, first of all, where God guides, he provides. Where God is sending you or God is opening a door for you, he's always going to provide for you. He's never going to send you without providing for you. Uh, if he sends you somewhere, he'll give you the resources that you need along with the way to get there. And we talked about this just for a moment. I won't go back into it, but just to make the statement so you'll remember that the how is for him. We often get caught up in the how. How is it going to happen? How am I going to get my bills paid? How is he going to heal me? How is this going to happen? The how is up to him. The obedience is up to us. We are to be obedient, to be faithful, to be loyal, and he takes care of the how. Secondly, last week we said that uh, where God leads us, he precedes us. Meaning that where God is taking us, he goes before us. Um, I just in my mind have that God was there on that scene of the wreck that day, Chris. And, and he led the doctors and the nurses and uh, the paramedics and all of those that cared for him uh, in the way that he could be healed. Amen. And so God goes before you and he makes the high place low and the crooked place straight. We talked about that. Third, last week we said that obedience is the key to the door of blessing. And that we could talk about for probably six weeks or more. Obedience is the key to the door of blessing. If you need a blessing in your life, then the number one thing you need is obedience. Not obedience to your wife, not obedience to your husband, but obedience to what this word has to say. This is the key to blessing. There is no other way. You can't make it on your good looks. You can't make it on your knowledge. You can't make it on your money. It is through obedience only. And so we spoke about that last week. I said to you that God loves showing up in unexpected ways at unexpected times. He loves to show up in unexpected ways and unexpected times. They were looking for a baby two years ago, but God's plan is two years later. Joni and I were looking for Jordan to show up five years ago, but she didn't. She showed up two years ago. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for that. I would love for him to show up a little earlier. But uh, he shows up in unexpected ways in unexpected times. I have to get my head wrapped around and you have to get your head wrapped around that he knows better how, he knows better when, and he knows better who than you do all the time. Amen. And so unexpected ways at unexpected times. And I talked to you last week about living a life 
um, surrendered to God's sovereignty. We spoke about that uh, for just a little bit. So tonight, let's pick it up and talk about the manna miracle. I want to talk to you for just a minute tonight about the manna miracle. And let me just say to you, preface this tonight by saying to you, if you're waiting on something to come to pass in your life, you need to pay special attention tonight to what I'm going to say to you tonight. Let's go. When God provided the manna in the wilderness, he only provided enough for each day. When God provided, I won't read the story, you know the story. When God provided the manna day in, day out, morning in, morning out, in the wilderness, he only provided enough for each day. Now, could God have sent all the manna they would have ever needed in one day? Yes, he could have. But if he would have sent all that they needed in one day, what would be the need for their faith? What would be the need for their loyalty? What would be their need to pray every day? Could God meet every need that you have right now, right here in this room, right now, tonight? Yes, he could do that. But if he met every need you have tonight in this room, once we got our needs met in this room, for some, we'd never see you again. So he provided the manna enough for each day. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over and those who gathered little had enough. God provided just enough. Why did he do that? The manna was a daily reminder of their dependence on God. I said the manna was a daily reminder of their dependence on God. God wanted to cultivate their daily dependence by providing their needs on a daily basis. Again, if everything you have need of was answered tonight, some of us would never pray again. There'd be no need for an altar. We would have no devotional life. We would have no dependence on God. We'll talk about it in just a moment that we would become, we would live a selfish life, independent lifestyle, separate from God. But listen, I have need of him every single day. Come on, somebody. Do you need him more today than you needed him yesterday? And if you needed him more today than you needed him yesterday, you're going to need him more tomorrow than you needed him today. Come on somebody we need him every single day and so we need to learn or we need to have that daily dependence on God that is what this was about I have a friend in Houston Texas that um, he has a cowboy church and when he started his church several years ago they started with 23 in his garage and in his garage, they started and they would have Sunday school. And then the 23, they would go from Sunday school right into Sunday morning service, right into an altar service, probably somewhere right there around his lawnmower because it's in his garage. And the 23 went from 23 to 40 and the 40 went to 80. And, and it got too big for his garage. So he went out and bought a circus tent. And he there in the town that he's from put that tent up and the 80 went to 100 and the 100 went to 200 and when I left Houston, Texas to come here he was running 900 in his services Amen. So they've built this big, beautiful building. It looks like a barn on the outside. It is a barn. Barn on the outside, barn on the inside. It is absolutely incredible. I loved it. I was, I was, I'll have to tell you, I was, I, I was guilty of the sin of covetousness because I loved his sanctuary. It was, it was just absolutely incredible. He's got some wonderful people in his church and he's got some wonderful givers in his church. And he called me one day and he said, he was just giving me a testimony. He said, you won't believe what's happened. He said, we have had to pay bill after bill after bill on this sanctuary. And he said, we were literally down to no money at all in our bank account. Anybody ever been there before? Now, we're not zeroed out here at the church, so don't worry. We're not going to tell you we're zeroed out. So you deacons can breathe easier now. 
we're not zeroed out, but he was zeroed out. He said, he said, I'm telling you, I had no idea what we were going to do. He's telling me the story. And he said, he said, Britt, he said, just yesterday morning when he called me, called me, he said, we, we, the banker called me and said, Pastor, and he said, I've known this banker for years. He said, Pastor, I just need to tell you that some bills are coming due for your church, and, and I need to tell you that you don't have any money in your bank account. And he said, I just want to know what do you want to do? Do you want me to put it on a personal credit card? Part of yours what do you want me to do and the pastor said I let me just I don't know what we're going to do anybody ever been there I don't know what we're going to do. Let me call you back in just a minute. And he said in between the time the guy called and he hung up, in just a few minutes said his phone rang twice. And he said one lady was hysterical when he answered the phone. She said, Pastor, this is so and so. And I just want you to know I am absolutely so, so sorry. She said, I want you to know I, I didn't mean to do that. He said, Sis, what do you mean? I, what are you talking about? She said, I forgot to pay my tithes yesterday. And she said, I just I want you to know I'll run the check down there real quick. By the way, we sold a piece of property last week and I'm paying tithes on my property so my tithe tech check today will be $23,000. I just want you to know, Pastor, I'll bring the check to you here in just a few minutes and he's crying. He said, okay, thank you. Sis, I said he hung up and just another turned around the phone rang again and said, Pastor, I'm so sorry. Yesterday I forgot to put my tithes in the checking account. I sold a bunch of my cows and got rid of a bunch of cows. I'm bringing the church a check for $15,000 here in just a few minutes. How many of you know that's exactly what he needed for right then? He didn't have the surplus, but God's meeting the need. Come on, somebody. Man, it wasn't raining. There wasn't millions in the bank. You may not have millions tonight. Come on, but you're going to get paid Friday. <laughs> Bible said that every good gift comes from the Father above. And listen, the Bible says, you've heard me talk about this before, and I won't get off on it tonight, but if you're king over the small things, the Lord said he'll make you ruler over the large things. If you take care of the 50, he's going to be more inclined to give you the 500. But if you can't take care of the 50, you're never getting to the 500. Amen. Somebody say amen. And so he still desires that from us, that dependence, that daily dependence on God. He still desires that from us. He wants us to depend on him daily. In the book that you're reading on page 112, the writer said God wants us to drop to our knees every day in raw dependence on him. And God knows that if he provided too much too soon, we would lose our spiritual hunger. He knows we'd stop trusting in our provider and start trusting in the provision. If God provided for you every time that you asked, what is the need? What is the need for my prayer life? What is the need for my hunger? I just wonder, is the church hungry again for God to do miracles? Is God hungry? Are we hungry? Is the church hungry? A daily dependence on him. Anything, listen to me, I don't know if this is on your sheet, and if it's not, you ought to write it down. Anything that leads to self-sufficiency leads us away from God. Anything, everybody say anything. Anything that leads us to self-sufficiency leads us away from God. Any time that I get to a point to think I can make it without him, I'm in trouble. Any time that I leave him or you leave him out of the equation, you are in trouble. If we look at most of the church's to-do list today, God is somewhere on the to-do list, but he is nowhere near the top. Because we have so many other things that have taken his place. And anything that leads to self-sufficiency leads us away from God. That is why we have so many churches today that aren't flourishing. That's why we have churches today that are not on fire. That's why we have marriages today that are failing. We left God out of the picture. That's why we our careers are failing. Because we prayed like like fire when we wanted the job and when we got the job we left the fire out 
I said we were desperate to get him. I've seen in 20 years hundreds and maybe even thousands of people come. Pray for me a job. Pray for me a better marriage. Pray for me. And they come Sunday after Sunday, altar service after altar service, time after time. And then once they finally get the answer, they are completely absent from the church. Oh yeah, you'll see them again when it all starts to go to hell again. Then you'll see them all of a sudden show up. And my response normally is, where have you been since the answer? Where? It is a daily dependence and anything that leads to self-sufficiency leads us away from God. One of our fundamental misunderstandings of spiritual maturity is thinking that it should result in self-sufficiency. I want to say that again. One of our fundamental misunderstandings of spiritual maturity is thinking that it should lead or it should result in self-sufficiency. Let me tell you this, and you ought to write this down too, maybe if you'd like. Walking with God never ends with self. I said, there should have been more amens. I said, walking, your walk with God never ends with self. Meaning that you don't reach a point in life or in your walk that I'm okay now. I don't need the prayer meeting anymore. I don't need the Bible study anymore. I don't need the Wednesday night class anymore. I'm, I'm Hey, Wednesday, Sunday mornings, hour or hour and a half or two hours if they stay that long. That's absolutely enough for me. I can handle the rest. Let me tell you what God is doing in this nation is driving the church back to a place where we have a daily dependency upon him we have become self sufficient and that will not work with God at all we pushed God out of the school. We pushed him out of the court. We pushed him out of our homes. We pushed him out of our churches. We pushed him out of our communities. And so now where we find ourselves is that God is driving us back. It never ends. Listen, you never, and I know you're the Wednesday night crowd. Go tell the Sunday morning crowd. We never reach a point to where we just don't need him anymore. I never reach a point to where I have too much Bible knowledge. I never reach a point to where I've heard every story over and over. Listen, this book is alive. I said, this book is alive. I've been studying this all day today and yesterday for Sunday. And I'm telling you, I've studied scriptures this past week, Brother Eversaw, and just even today that I have read all of my life and they've come to life a different way. Come on, somebody. This word is living. It never gets dull. It never gets old. It never gets out of date. Come on, somebody. It's for you every single day. Sunday, we're going to preach if the Lord will let me. I think he will. I believe he's the one that gave me the sermon. I'm going to preach on, and I know this is bad grammar, but I'm sorry. I'm going to preach on I ain't no sissy. <laughs> Come on, listen. In the kingdom of God today, you can't be a sissy. We don't need a tiptoe through the tulips gospel. Come on. We need people with courage. We need people with faithfulness. Come on. So y'all come Sunday morning ready to have church. The goal isn't independence. The goal is co-dependence on God. How many people, and don't answer me, how many people do we know that have struggled and struggled and so many problems, a book of problems, a library full of problems, they come and get saved and get in the church for a little while and then when the guilt wears off and when the difficulty wears off, their loyalty wears off. It isn't independence. It's the, the goal is codependence on God. Our desire for self-sufficiency is a subtle expression of our sinful nature. That's a good sentence. I said, our desire for self-sufficiency is a subtle expression of our sinful desire or our sinful nature. Say it one more time. Our desire for self-sufficiency. Don't raise your hand, but everybody in this room, including myself, we have just known at times we're right and everybody else is wrong.
Our desire to be right, our desire for self-sufficiency, it is a subtle expression of our sinful nature. It's a desire to get to a place where we don't need God, we don't need faith, and we don't need to pray. Does that not sound like our nation today? Does it not sound exactly like where we are living today? I can tell you that if I would have preached this back during my granny's time, they'd have ran me out of the church. Because you pray. Anybody in there know anything about praying? You prayed. You prayed. You prayed. As long as they prayed. Faith. Prayer. And the need of God. It is a subtle desire that works against our sinful nature when self-sufficiency creeps in. Listen, spiritual maturity is learning to rely on God more and more each day, not less and less. That's a great sentence. Spiritual maturity, because we have all kinds, listen, we have all kinds of theologians in the church today. Oh, we just have folks walk around the word, the word just pours out of their pores. Listen, even the devil knew the Bible. So I'm not impressed. What about your lifestyle? What about how you treat people? Who are you winning to the... Who are you winning for the cross? Listen, spiritual maturity is learning to rely on God more and more each day, not less and less. But we have it the reverse because of, of self-sufficiency and pride that we think because we know and we've been on the board and we've been taught the class and we've been in the church and we paid our tithes and we've done this, that it has elevated me to a level where I just simply don't need those things anymore. I've reached the point of sainthood. Can't you see my halo no I don't see your halo but I see your horns <laughs> spiritual maturity is learning to rely on God more and more each day not less and less holy complications Pastor Norton kind of preached around this the other day when he was here. So let me talk to you for a moment about holy complications. We all want life to be simpler. Right? Wouldn't you like just a simpler life? Wouldn't you like a less busier life? Talked to a man on the phone last night that, that has just moved to this area and he is from the San Diego area. And so we got to talking about, he talked about saying San Diego, I started talking about living in Houston and we were both talking about how glad we are that now we're in the woods. <laughs> if you whine about living here, let me suggest a few places for you to go live for a little while. The, 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 the other country I just moved here from, <laughs> nobody knows anybody. You're just a number, right? You go to a restaurant, and I'll probably get in trouble for this, but, but customer service is horrid because what they are banking on is the fact they'll never see you again. But down here at Colton's, they know my name. Come on. We went to McDonald's yesterday or Monday with Pastor Gary. And my Lord, everybody in McDonald's knows who he is. <laughs> Even some of the customers that were coming in there, there he is, there he is, there he is. They knew the coffee he liked to drink. They had it sitting on the counter before he ever ordered. <laughs> and when he ordered a a biscuit they were absolutely floored that he was going to eat because he doesn't eat. He just gets coffee. I stood there and I thought, wow, this is awesome. Most people would call this small town hick, redneck stuff. I call it home. 
Come on. Because where I come from, they couldn't care less. They couldn't care less about you. How'd I get off on that? We want, we, we should want, I'm not sure we do, want life to be simpler. Man, I'll tell you, I'd love to, well, I know you're not supposed to, so I hope I'm not causing you to see him here. I'd love to go back just to a day to see my granny swinging on the front porch. And that old wood screen door and that big, screen, that big spring on it, y'all remember that? And hear that door open, the sound it makes, you know what I'm saying? Are you hearing that sound? It makes that sound as you open it, because we open it all the way as far as it possibly would go. And then we just let it go. That there's no paint on that, on that trim, any whatsoever. And every time we let it go, we were threatened with our lives. I'm going to beat you to death for you to let that door do that again. Pow! I'd do it again. I'd love to hear that again. But you can't do that anymore. I'd love to go to bed at night with the windows up. And you can hear the frogs and the whippoorwills and the... But you can't do that anymore. I'd love to leave when I first got my first truck in, in high school. Brother Eversaw, I'd pull in my front yard and get out of that truck and leave the keys in the ignition and the door wide open and walk right on in the house. Now, if you come out, it's in Mexico by the time. <laughs> or Canada or somewhere else. I'm not shooting at Mexico. I said Canada too. Anywhere else. You can't do that anymore. You can't do that stuff. I'd love, and I said that, listen, we're just going down memory lane. I'll be back in just a second. I don't know how many people said to me Monday night standing out here how much they appreciated what we were doing. And then I would say something to the tune of when I was a kid on this night, we would get on our bicycle at dark and we wouldn't come home to 10, 10.30, 10 11 o'clock with a pillowcase full of candy. <laughs> come on, sometimes we forgot where we left our bicycle. We had to go back the next day and find it. We walked home. My mother never came looking for us one time. No p police looking for us. And we would go home and, and dump that candy upside down in the floor and eat nearly every bit we could and nobody had to check it for poison, razors, needles. But we can't do that anymore. We all want a simpler life. Less complicated. That is a good pursuit in most areas of life. However, it is a dangerous pursuit in our spiritual life. Holy complication. Listen, this is going to mess some of you up for just a second, but hear me through. Holy complications are needed in order to continually grow our dependence on God. I said holy complications are needed. Difficult times, our learning to lean on God, learning to lean on his dependency. I would say to you that the manna, the days of manna was a holy complication that was needed in order for the people to continually grow in their dependence on God. And so if he needed that for them, how much more do you need that today? There are complications that you and I face. Listen, there is going to be life. There are going to be difficult days. Brother Norton said it the other day, and I don't, I, I better not say it. He said, someday you're the pigeon and someday you're the statue. <laughs> life is just going to happen. There are going to be difficult times because that is just life. But there are difficult days along the way that are designed to drive you back to an altar or to drive you to the Bible study or drive you to your prayer closet or to drive you to a place of saying, God, if you don't show up today, then I don't know what's going to happen. I need you. And so there, 
are holy complications that show up. Let's talk about them just for a moment. I don't know if this will be encouraging or discouraging, but the will of God does not get easier. The will of God gets harder. I said, I don't know if this will be. If you just got here tonight, this is your first time to Christianity at all. I'm not meaning to discourage you because I'm telling you, he'll make every step with you. But the will of God does not get easier. Remember I said the other night, new levels, new devils. New levels, new devils. The, the, the will of God does not get easier. The more you make advances, I'll talk to you about this on Sunday maybe, the more that you make advances towards the kingdom of hell, the more difficulty you're going to face in your life. Well, pastor, then I'll just sit back and I'll be quiet and I'll be doing nothing. Then what is the reason for your Christianity? Complications are evidence of God's blessing. Go write it down. Complications are evidence of God's blessing. I told you last Wednesday, people brought and laid all kinds of things on these altars. You've heard some of it tonight and last week. And people have told me since then, Pastor, I'm not sure I should have brought those things because it's gotten worse for me. It's gotten more difficult for me. Listen, at times that ought to be a compliment to you from hell because you must be doing something right. Heaven's not going to penalize you for doing something right. Hell's going to try to block you from doing something right. And if he can steal your confidence, if he can steal your self-worth, if he can take who you believe you are and what you believe is going on in your life, if he can take that from you, then he'll cause you to sit in your pew and you will be of no effect any whatsoever. Complication, I said to you last week, I believe that it was, they should make you better, not bitter. They should make you better. You should understand that if hell has been unleashed on my home and I have no active sin in my life, then I understand that I'm doing the right thing and God's answer is on the way and hell is mad because I... The blessings of God, I'm sorry, the blessing of God won't just bless you, they will also complicate your life. Sin will complicate your life in negative ways. The blessing of God will complicate your life in positive ways. Listen to me, the challenge then is to be willing to embrace a holy complication. You are fake. Come on, let me. I, I, maybe this is a little cloudy. You're, you're, there's no active sin in your life. You're, you're doing the right thing. You're applying yourself. You're marching towards the city. You're, you're trying to do everything you know how to live right, do right, act right, talk right. You're trying to apply yourself. You're loyal. You're faithful. And hell is still emptying out into your living room. Then I tell you, my advice is to you, keep doing what you're doing, baby, because it's working. Hell is doing whatever it can do to stop you. When you have a difficulty, write this down, all of you. If when you have a difficulty, there's one number one thing you ought to stop and do right off the bat. Lord, have I stepped out of your will? Right? Because we get confused. Some here even tonight would say, Pastor, it's hard for me to praise God in the middle of my complications. Hard for me to do that. Then what you need to do is stop when you see difficulty and say, Lord, am I still in alignment? Have I gone left when you said go right? Have I gone right when you said go left? Have I met, and listen, he's your daddy. He's your father. And if you have, it's his responsibility to tell you, yeah, you've blown it. Here is how you did it. And if that's the case, then you need to make it right. But if that's not the case, it's hell trying to empty out in your living room because you're doing the right thing. Complications. God brings into our lives because they grow us and lead us to fulfilling his purpose for us. 
I said complications God brings into our lives because they grow us and lead us to fulfilling his purpose for us. Talk to Job. Job lost everything. But before the enemy took it, who did he have to ask? Everything comes through God's clearinghouse before it gets to you. The devil had to ask for permission. He said, he said but, but I know what you'll do. You, you'll intervene. God said, no, I'm not going to intervene. intervene. The only thing you can't do is you can't touch his life. You do whatever else you want to do. This is a holy complication. He said, you do whatever else you want to do, but don't you touch. And so what the enemy did, here he goes, takes his family, takes his Cadillac camels, <laughs> takes his big fine home, takes his kids. <laughs> big tornado comes through, wash away, wipes away the entire farm. God already knew what Job would do in the end. Come on, y'all. I said, God already knew what Job would do in the end because he created him. He knew who was on the inside of him. He knows what you have on the inside of you. And you may be facing hell that's emptied out in your living room, but listen, God's already approved the complication because he knows that you're going to stay faithful. He knows you're going to stay loyal. Come on, that ought to, that ought to shake you up tonight. I, I said, that ought to, but, but it doesn't shake some of us up because we're not a threat to anybody. We're not shaking nobody up. Pastor, I don't even know what you're preaching about this for. I don't have no problems. I don't have no problem, any whatsoever. Man, I got more money than I need. I got more happiness than I need. My kids are all racked and right. Then then please come take this microphone from me and preach to me. (laughs) Or you need to run down here and get this altar here in just a second. With every promotion, there are complications. With every promotion, there are complications. So the same could be said, new levels, new devils. With every promotion, there are complications. If you've ever gotten a promotion on your job, you faced a whole new level of issues, problems, and whatever at that next step than you ever faced at this step. Why? Because when you stepped up, you took more authority. You took more responsibility. It took more loyalty. It took more faithfulness. You understand? And so the new level that you are at now in God, the new level now that the church is in God, when we move forward and we are advancing on the kingdom of hell, we are making advance, we are promoting, you are being promoted, then you're going to face new enemies than you ever faced at this level. Promotion, with every promotion, there are new complications. You can't expect to have a simple and boring life and move the heart of God who is, a, who is fierce and daring. I'll say that again because that should have pierced you. You can't expect to have a simple and boring life and move the heart of God who is fierce and daring. It would have been absolutely a, I hope I say it this way, non-interesting story, a boring story. If Peter and all the other goofballs just sat in the boat when Jesus come walking out on the water. Right? You read the story. Peter, whoever, whatever, whatever, they all that are sat there in the boat, and there goes Jesus across the water. Next page. Well, what was that in there for? Didn't learn anything. Somebody had to take a risk. But listen, that is how a lot of Christians live their lives. Sitting in the boat. Did y'all see that? 
I think that was Jesus. I'm not sure. Because you've never been close enough to him to know. Thirty two hundred and fifty people. Well, I just stayed home and locked my doors and turned the lights out. I didn't have anybody. That boy got up out of that wheelchair and walked. He must have had a good doctor. Because you're not close enough to him to know him. Peter said, you sit here. I'm getting out. You sit here and watch him go by. I'm getting out. We have churches that are just going to sit there and watch him walk right by. We have congregation members that are going to sit there and the glory moves through this sanctuary Sunday after Sunday, time after time, and people just sit. And I'll be even surprised if they'll recognize when they hear the trumpet. Because they thought they were close enough. When all along they were absolutely no threat. Just stay in the boat. I have to with my spiritual imagination. I have a crazy one. So you use yours. I have to think that when Peter sitting in the front of that boat that night. And when he saw him he knew immediately what he was going to do. Because he's blown it before. I'm going. Y'all can sit here if you want to. I think in just my mind. That when he had the first conversation, the words with Jesus, those guys are sitting back there going, sit down, man, sit down. Sit, you stupid, sit down. Would you just sit down? And I just have in my mind that maybe a couple of them got it. <laughs> you stay here. I'm getting out. We don't serve a God that is just sitting on a throne watching the world turns. Watching things go by. We have a fierce God. Come Sunday, I'm going to preach to it. I ain't no sissy. <laughs> we don't serve a God that's just sitting there with his arms folded trying to figure out what he's going to do next. And what's going to happen next. Hmm. If I don't go on, I'll preach it to you. And then you won't come Sunday. His, I'm sorry, he is taking a risk on you every day. And he wants you to daily take a risk with him. He is taking, he, he listen, I, I don't want to get hung up here because I need to finish chapter 11 tonight. He took a risk on getting on the cross for you. Say amen. He took a risk. He took a risk on his blood being poured out for you and I. He took a risk. So why aren't we willing to take a risk? The issue today, and I'm not sure if it's not the sin of our comfortability. Ooh, I just don't want to rock the boat, Pastor. You know, I just don't want to shake things up. I just, you know, I, I, just, I, just, I just don't. That I then submit to you is why we don't see more miracles happening than what? Because if Peter would have just sat there, what would have happened in the miracle of him walking on the water? Well, he didn't walk on the water, Pastor. Yeah, he did. The issue is, the problem is he took his eyes. We sink, we fail. When we take our eyes Do you have the courage to ask God To complicate your life 
any way he sees fit. I bet I can answer for 95% of us in this room. Do we have the courage to ask God to complicate our lives in such a way that he sees fit? If not, then expect nothing great or miraculous to happen to you. Because without complications, without him stirring my nest, then I'm just passing time. Come on, without me getting out of the boat, I'm just floating along right on with everybody else. Wait until this thing's over. Oh, pastor, we're getting closer and closer. Some guy said to me last night, and he meant it arrogantly, and that was okay. And, and he said, I introduced myself, and he said, you're the preacher? I said, well, yeah, didn't you just heard me say, introduce myself. I didn't say that. I said, yes, I am. I'm the pastor of the church. He said, boy, bet you'd like a line this long to get in your church Sunday. <laughs> and I'm telling you, there was just, I mean, instantly he caught the attention of Eric because he said it really loud. He caught the intention of probably about 25 people standing around him. And I said, oh, yeah, just hang around. And after we're gone from here, you'll see a line this long. It just went. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see a line that long get into church. But I'm not sure before Jesus returns we will. Because the church has gone to sleep. There'll be a line that long one day. But it'll be too late. I don't know who will stand here and preach. I don't know who's going to sing. Because I hope he stays right till he gets to go with us. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. I don't know who's going to do the altar service. I don't know who's going to run the sound. I don't care. Because we'll be out of here. But I have a suspicion that it'll be that long. And I have a suspicion that one day the prayer of mine, of this church being full, it'll be answered. But I'm not sure it'll be before the rapture. Because everyone is willing. To just sit and watch. If you expect. Nothing great or miraculous things to happen to you, then just sit back and keep living like you're living. Chapter 12. 11. <laughs> I was speaking by faith. So let's talk for a minute about the no answer. Everybody say no. no. Come on, you want to say it to me for a long time. Say no. no. Well, that's good. <laughs> what do you do when he says no? Do you know when he says no? Do we listen for him to say no? Right? So, Daddy, can I go outside and play? No. Two seconds later. Daddy, can I go outside and play? No. We don't like to hear. 
Some of the hardest moments during life are when you've prayed hard and prayed and prayed, but the answer is no, and you don't know why. We all have been told no by God at one point or another. Why do you think God says no? Well, first of all, let's talk about it quick tonight. First of all, I believe that he says no, number one, to see if we will trust him anyway. Okay, so the, no, the answer is no, so now what are you going to do? Okay, so God, the answer is no to that, so what's plan B? What do we do now? The answer comes at times no to see if we're going to trust him and next to trust what about him? Number one or the first little bullet point there I think on your worksheet is to trust his sovereignty. Do we trust what that means is what I'm trying to say there to you is is do we trust his plan better than our plan? He has reasons beyond our reason. Lord, I want this fancy car. I want this car. No. You're going to get this old used pinto. <laughs> Lord, I don't want the pinto. Everybody's got a Cadillac. You're driving a pinto. I have to trust that God knows about me driving the Pinto. And that his reason for me driving it is far better than my driving. Some things is that he can see that you're about to get a pink slip on your job. Some things he can see, he can see a break in on your car. He can see, he can see, I must trust his sovereignty to see that he can see further than what I can dream and he has an answer further than what I can think through. Do we trust him? Next, the next second little bullet point is, is that, is that we must trust his love. We trust he is for us even when he doesn't give us what we want. Come on, everybody in this room, I'm sure, at one point has been angry with God because we didn't get what we wanted. We didn't get it like we wanted, how we wanted. And so in the no, God is trying to, tr trying to check your love for him that no matter if you tell me no, the reason no comes as no is that there must be something down the road I don't know of and you're looking out for my betterment so I still love you even though you said no. Your kids can't understand why you won't let them go out with that group of friends. Come on, it's because you know stuff about that, friends, that your kids may not know. And because you don't want to mess everything up, right, and you don't want to cause a big bunch of problems, you don't tell them what you know, so you just say no. Come on, how many of you know they just bow when you say no and they understand? <laughs> right? Your kids do that? Mine don't. Mine go storming off upstairs. <laughs> Slam the door. And then here I come. And you just think of the rest, uh, whatever you want to think. <laughs> the no is because I know better. The no is because I've been there and done that. And so I say no. God, I said to you earlier in chapter 10 that he, wherever he sends you, he precedes you. He's been there before you and he's... <clears throat> Next... <clears throat> We trust his mystery. What do you mean? We trust his mystery. Sometimes he says no, and it's a mystery to us. I don't know. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. People, <clears throat> I'll use this as an example. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's even happened in our own family that, that a female 
has become pregnant and gone and lost the baby. And I've had, I've had them come to me and say, <clears throat> why, why did God do this? Why did God cause this to happen? My answer to that is, I don't know. I don't know. And one day, dealing with a female that this had happened to, and they were distraught over it. And she said, sitting in my office, why has the Lord allowed this to happen? Why is this happening? <clears throat> the thought, excuse me. Can somebody get me a drink of water? <coughs> How about I get it? And so I said to them, it just came to me sitting there, maybe God saw something down the road for that child. Maybe that child was going to be, and I, please, don't take, please don't get messed up with me here, maybe that child was going, to be deform, was going to be handicapped or have some kind of heart effect that this family could not pay for all of that child's life. Maybe God saw something that you couldn't see. And so that baby now is in heaven. We're going to pray God will give you another one. <clears throat> I don't know. So those are the mysteries of God. All of those will be revealed someday when you and I get there. But listen, I submit to you, if we make it there, we won't care by then. <clears throat> the hardest thing about praying is enduring unanswered prayers. If you don't guard your heart... Unresolved anger toward God can undermine faith. Let me read that to you again because you've, I want you to get this tonight because some of you are being told no right now. The hardest thing about praying is enduring unanswered prayers or enduring the no. And if you don't guard your heart, unresolved anger toward God can undermine your faith. Well, I guess he just don't care about me. Well, he answered his prayer, and, and he didn't answer my prayer. He's walking, but my kid's still not walking. There are some things that are the mysteries to God. I <clears throat> preach a sermon that is just simply, I just called it why. And just walk through the whys of life. Asking God the whys of life. And let me just tell you, there's going to be some things we're just not going to get an answer to here. There's some things I've prayed about for years and, and the Lord has never said one blessed word to me about it. And so I have just decided, okay, well, that's just not it. So let's just go on to something else. There's just some things <clears throat> that you're not going to get an answer to here. There's just some things we're not going to have an, a reason why to. It's the mysteries of God. But listen to me, I don't want to leave that undone. At the end of that day, he's still God. I said, at the end of that day, he's still God. At the end of that day, he's still on the throne. At the end of that day, he's all sovereign. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning. He's still God. What we perceive as unanswered prayers are often the greatest answers. What we perceive as unanswered prayers are often the greatest answers. <clears throat> Garth Brooks, a country singer, saying years ago, I thank God for unanswered prayers. And he is praying about some woman. <laughs> well, how do you know that song, Pastor Britt? I heard it. I'll just tell you, I heard it. Pretty simple, I heard it. And so did you. <laughs> Let's go out and listen to your car right now. Come on, you're sitting there acting all holy and saintly and the halo. Oh. Give me your keys. Give me a house key. Let's just go find out. He said, I thank God for unanswered prayers. What he was praying about was a girl he used to date. And now he's married and married somebody else. He saw this girl. I don't know where they was at. I don't know. I didn't pay that much attention to the song. 
but he saw her somewhere. He's thinking, oh, dear God, thank God for unanswered prayer. <laughs> Come on. Some of y'all have done that too, right? Come on, say amen. You cruising down over at CV's, pushing a buggy. You round the corner into him. You hadn't seen him since high school. You're like, oh my God, you're so scared. Oh, Jesus, thank God for unanswered prayer. When you was in high school, you was down here at this altar. Lord, let me marry him. Lord God, please let me marry him. Lord Jesus, let me go to the prom with him. Later on, you're like, mm, mm, mm. This scare the cats off a liver truck. <laughs> you can laugh. It's all right. We. Mm. Mm, we went to our, I hope nobody's watching this. We went to our 20, we went to our 20 year high school reunion and, um, and we went to the, I told Johnny, I said, we're going in and going out. I said, we we'll walk in and walk out. We walk right on in. I cruised the place, turned around. I walked right, I saw all I needed to see. We walked right back out. I got Johnny. We went to the car and I said, we got in the car. The first thing I said is, I said, please, dear God, tell me I don't look like three quarters of those people in there. <laughs> Come on, if you did that, raise your hand. Come on, raise it higher, and I'm going to preach online for the rest of you the next time. Right? I said to Johnny, surely I look younger than those people do, don't I? She said, she just acted like some of y'all did right there. She just kept laughing. It's a fake laugh. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, really. I don't look like... <laughs> Some of the best prayers are unanswered prayers. Man, because if he would have answered some of your prayers, you'd be in a mess today. Come on, say amen. amen. They were a Christian, now the day they're not. Come on, that job that you prayed for, if you'd have got it, they'd have kicked you out by now. They, they sold a business, went bankrupt. Come on. If they'd have answered it that way, you was praying for it. You'd be in a mess today. Secondly, he says no, and I'll move fast. I got five minutes. I can do this. We're not laughing now. <laughs> laugh if time's over. Isn't it good to come to church and laugh? Isn't it? The Bible said it's like a medicine. Come on, some of you took more medicine today than the pharmacy's got. And you still don't feel no better, right? But when you laugh a little, it makes you feel better. Second, he says no to see if you'll obey him. Lord, I want that car. Nope. Next day you're down at the bank signing up for that car. You can't pay for the car. If we submit, I'm sorry, if we will submit to his leading, if we will honor his word on the issue, he will bring the blessing to pass in your life. It's that simple. Our heavenly father is far too wise and loves us far too much to give us Everything we ask for. I said he loves you far too much and he's far too wise to give you everything you ask for. Sometimes God gets us in, I'm sorry, sometimes God gets in the way to show us the way. I said sometimes God gets in the way to show us the way. Let me move fast here. Brother Mike, go up if you would and play something. Let me talk to you real fast about the key of David. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 8, the Bible said, And the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things, says, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens one and shuts and shuts and shuts one, I'm sorry, and no one opens. Verse 8 says, I know your works. I see I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word. For you who have little strength have kept my word and have not denied my name. 
Matthew chapter 16 verse 19 said, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Keys always speak of access, authority, and accountability. He said, I give unto you the keys. I give unto you the keys. I give unto you the keys. I give unto you the keys of heaven and whatever you buy, I give you the authority. I give you the access. I give you the accountability. These keys speak of access. I'm the pastor of this church. I have keys to this church. So therefore I have access with because of those keys to go wherever in this church I want to go. There are a few different keys for a few different things. But there is one key that will get me into everything. With this one key, I can open every door on this property. Now, if I give you one of the others, you can only get into certain places because you don't have the access and you don't have the authority to be there and you don't have the accountability to be there. But because I have the key, I have the access, I have the authority, I have the accountability to go there because I, because I hold the keys. He said, so therefore I give you the keys. So now he has the keys. So what did I just give up? I just gave up my access. I just gave up my authority. I just gave up my accountability because now he holds the keys. I'm glad you play the organ and not baseball. (laughs) The keys will let me in. Jesus said, I give unto you, not me, you. He said, I give you the keys of heaven and whatever you use it, I give you the access, I give you the authority, I give you the accountability and tonight you hold the keys but what some of us have done is we took the key. Go hide it, please, go hide it. Go hide it, go hide it, go hide it. Or, or, hey, I'll tell you what, go put it up for just safekeeping. That way we'll know where it is when we need it. They go with me wherever I go. Why? Because I have access to places because of them that no one else should have. So therefore I'm accountable and I need to have. Should go with me everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. I hide the word of God in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Oh, but what we do is we, we'll get that later. Who went to the bathroom? Who brushed their teeth? Who went to Walmart today? Who did that? Who did that? We got to know all that. And we know nothing. Jesus said, I gave you the answer. I gave you all the answer. Listen to me. There'll be on that day, and I know you're the Wednesday night crowd, but on that day, there'll be no excuses. There'll be no excuses as to why you weren't used in the gifts. There'll be no excuses as to why you couldn't be in the choir. There'll be no excuses as to why you couldn't get in. There'll be no, no, no excuses. There'll be no, no excuses like the man at the pool, John, in, in the book of John, said, I've been laying here for 38 years, and they push me down every time the glory of God shows up. Jesus said, get up and do something you've never done before. I have in my mind, Jesus was like, don't give me no excuses. Stop blaming your lack of receiving my ability on everybody else because everybody here has the same opportunity. That was good. Are you willing to let God close some doors in your life? I 
I said, are you willing to let God close some doors in your life? You see, the story with Elijah and Elisha, the scripture, and I love that story, said, Elijah said to Elisha, if you want what I've got, then be there. You can't just sit in the boat and watch me go by. You can't just keep, keep plowing in this field and hope I'll come back by here in a little while. If you want what I got, then be there. There's a, there's a series of sermons, six months of it right there. Then be there. We want the miracles, but we don't show up. We want this, but we don't apply ourselves. We want to be blessed, but we're not tithers. We want to do this, but we don't get. And the amazing thing about this story is, is with Elijah and Elisha, what did Elisha do? I thought was absolutely incredible. Elijah said to him, let the dead bury their dead. Let you do that. And, and the Bible said that Elisha set on fire all of his equipment. Man, he burnt the plow, he burnt the horses, he burnt the field, he burnt the barn down, he burnt the fuel. <laughs> Elijah, Elisha sets fire to everything. Why? Because he made up his mind. I'm not coming back here no more. I'm going to leave no room for excuses for me to come back if this don't work out. I'm putting all my eggs in this basket. Are you willing to let God close some doors in your life? But we leave some open in case this don't work out. Come on, we leave the door open to some old friendships. We make stay connected in some other churches, you know, in case this one don't work out. Well, we still got friends. We still got it over there. And when I show up, they'll, you know, let us take me right in because the door is still open. We may not have the door wide open, but we got a little crack. Are you willing to let God close the door? Let me fill in your blanks real fast and I'm done. The last blank there is, and I'm going to skip over some of this. The last one is learning to stand still. The story is found in Exodus chapter 14. It's on your sheet there. You can go study it. Four things God says to you when you're waiting on a prayer to be answered. One, first, don't be afraid. Second, stand still. Third, see the salvation of the Lord. And fourth, hold your peace. Don't be afraid. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. Hold your peace. And there's two things he says he'll do for you. One, he will reveal where he is working. And secondly, the Lord will fight for you. Are you able to accept a no? Are you able to wait? I don't like waiting either. But I have to keep in mind that when, I, when and while I'm waiting, I have to trust that he's out putting all the pieces together. Come on, he's running over here and he's working on this one. Come on, because you know, you're, you know, you're praying for the house loan to go through, but he's got to deal with a hard-headed banker. Come on. And the price was too high, so he's got to deal with the owners to, hey, well, it's not selling. Nobody's looking, so let's knock the price off. So he's got to run over and deal with them. Are you with me? And he's got to run over here and deal with a realtor that wants 10%. Come on, they get saved and they're not getting so greedy and then they'll come back to you and say, hey, I'll give you three. I'll do it for three. <laughs> See, he's got to deal with all those pieces. He's got to run around, put all, take all that. So while you're waiting, you have to envision, remember, you have to see it before you see it or you'll never see it. And sometimes you've just got to see him. Well, I know you're working on that, Lord. I know you're working on that. I know you're working on that. I'm just going to stand here and be still. Till your perfect will comes to pass. Amen. Lord, thank you.